welcome to a brand new episode of the podcast entitled Couch Potatoes Unite! Exclamation point, which is based on a blog with the same name because these United Couch Potatoes are really one cluster of TV-loving individuals. Do you sense what I'm saying? My name is Kylie and I love TV. If you feel the same, keep listening and or checking out our website, couchpotatoesunite.wordpress.com, as you're bound to find some common ground or something you like for at Couch Potatoes Unite or all about the wonders and unique long-form storytelling of the small screen. CPU, exclamation point, is basking in the new fall season and hopes you've been following releases of brand new episodes of the podcast on Wednesdays, as well as new blog entries on some Tuesdays, and as always, we have several more new episodes on the way. Because the panels and I live lives behind our podcast, the episodes are published once per week. Subscribe to the blog or the podcast via iTunes, Stitcher Radio, and via Google Play to stay on top of brand new episodes. Episodes already published discuss a variety of shows around the water cooler, including but not limited to Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt, The Vampire Diaries, The Good Place, Grace and Frankie, Game of Thrones, Broad Church, Stranger Things, iZombie, Fuller House, American Horror Story, Doctor Who, Supernatural, The X-Files, Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., Gotham, and the four shows of the Arrowverse on the CW. Plus, new episodes are in the works, including revisits for a series of unfortunate events, New Girl, The Originals, Once Upon a Time, 13 Reasons Why, Orange is the New Black, Schitt's Creek, and the Marvel's Defenders panel will talk Season 3 of Daredevil. We'll be launching new panels covering The Crown, Westworld, Arrested Development, Jane the Virgin, and The Americans. We'll be launching a new feature called Versus, where we'll be comparing shows in a spicy debate. And because we look back at shows now past, we'll be looking back at one of our most popularly requested panels of all time, Friends. And I swear to you, friends, that it is coming sometime in the near future. Let us all cross our fingers and go to Central Perk together. Once more, CPU is going live again. We've been planning some live events, as I've repeatedly been alluding to in these introductions. And we're super excited about them. Our first is a special live event coming up November 10th, 2018, when we return for our third annual appearance to Grand Rapids Comic Con in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and launch our newest chapter in our Versus feature, trekking through the final frontier, the CPU voyage into the neutral zone, and the ultimate battle within the Star Trek universe and all of its generations. We also have more live appearances and other cool stuff being planned, so make sure you like or follow us at our Facebook page, our Twitter at CPU Podcast, our Instagram at Couch Potatoes Unite, or subscribe to the blog, our YouTube channel, our iTunes channel, our Stitcher Radio channel, or find us on Google Play. In the meantime, if you don't hear a show on this podcast format, fellow panelists and I still write reviews and we always seek new panelists, so if you have any interest in joining the discussion, say hello by finding us at any of those outlets I've mentioned. At the very least, stop by and leave us a thumbs up, comment, or review. We like feedback. Just don't presume you can have it all, like whispers. Say it with love. Today's panel is looking back and taking a first look, or complicated like that, at an American science fiction television series produced and streamed by Netflix, which means that it is available to Netflix subscribers exclusively as it is Netflix-produced original content. If you aren't already aware, from time to time, CPU will be choosing shows of all types, but usually of some fame or notoriety to reminisce about, and to consider whether or not they age gracefully, like a fully in-sync cluster of homo sensorium persons, or don't hold up as well, like a kidnapped whispers after murdering the rest of his cluster. Oh, by the way, spoiler. As such, this is another chapter of our Looking Back podcast episodes, where we review a show that has been gone, either via natural end or cancellation for some time. And today, that show is Sense8, streamed on Netflix for two seasons from 2016 to 2018, with a total of 24 episodes. Created by Lana and Lily Wachowski and J. Michael Straczynski for Netflix, Sense8's first season introduced a multinational ensemble cast with Amal Amin, Duna Bay, Jamie Clayton, Tina Desai, Tuppence Middleton, Max Reimelt, Miguel Angel Silvestre, and Brian J. Smith, portraying eight strangers from different parts of the world who suddenly become sensates, or human beings who are mentally and emotionally linked. Freema Agumon, Terrence Mann, Anupam Kerr, Naveen Andrews, and Daryl Hannah also star. In the second season, Toby Anumir replaces Amin. The show aims to explore subjects that its creators feel have not been emphasized in many science fiction shows to date, such as politics, identity, sexuality, gender, and religion. The story of Sense8 begins when the psychic connection of eight strangers from different cultures and parts of the world is birthed, quote-unquote, by a woman called Angelica, played by Hannah, who kills herself to avoid capture by a man named Whispers, played by Man. The eight eventually discover they now form a cluster of sensates, or human beings who are mentally and emotionally linked, 
can sense and communicate with each other, and can share their knowledge, language, and skills. In the first season, the eight, Kefius, Sun, Nomi, Kala, Riley, Wolfgang, Lido, and Will, are shown trying both to live their everyday lives and to figure out how and why they're connected. Meanwhile, a sensate named Jonas, who was involved with Angelica, comes to their aid, while the Biologic Preservation Organization, or BPO, and Whispers, a high-ranking sensate inside BPO, attempt to hunt them down. In the second season, the eight have grown accustomed to their connection and help each other on a daily basis. They learn more about Homo sensorium, the scientific name of sensates, the history and goals of BPO, the role of Angelica in it, and their powers and how to temporarily suspend them. They also meet other sensates, not all of whom are friendly. At the same time, Jonas attempts to both aid them and look after himself after being captured by Whispers, who is now involved in the cat and mouse game with Will, each of them trying to outsmart the other. The first season, consisting of 12 episodes, was met with generally favorable critical reception. It was praised for its representation of LGBTQ characters and themes, winning the GLAAD Media Award for Outstanding Drama Series. It was also recognized with the Location Manager's Guild Award for its use of locations as an integral part of the story. The second season began with a two-hour Christmas special in December 2016, with the remaining 10 episodes released in May 2017. The season was met with positive critical reception, however, the following month, Netflix announced that they had canceled the series, which had ended with a cliffhanger and expectation of a third season, then under negotiation. In response to criticism of the cancellation, especially with an unresolved story, Netflix produced a two-and-a-half-hour series finale, which was released on June 8, 2018. Today, for CPU's look back at Sense8, we've gathered a small but robust cluster comprised of familiar CPU panelists who are eager to dive into this sensory treat. It should be noted that all of our panelists have viewed the entire series and may discuss sensitive plot points. So for those of you who have not watched any of Sense8 and plan to do so, listen at your own risk, as there may be major spoilers. At this time, I'd like to introduce our panel. All three of them have been on the podcast before, so they know how this works, but I'm going to remind you, listener. What I'd like you to do, panel, is to identify yourself by your first name, just your first name, not your whole life story, and how you came to watch Sense8. What made you start watching? How did you find out about it? What kept you watching? Did you watch all of it? Because this is a Looking Back podcast. And then how would you rate your interest in the show? And you get to give us two answers. Tell us how you felt at the beginning as you first started to watch it, and how you felt at the end after the series finale. Sound good? Sure. Yeah. Yep. Sure. <laughs> yes. Okay, yay. <laughs> so how would you rate your interest along the standard CPU character question, which changes with each show we do? Do you adore this show? Because it represents the entire spectrum of humanity across race lines, sexuality lines, and gender lines. Sense8 is about more than individual characters, it's about how we're all connected, despite our starkest differences, and you will do anything you can to fight for the show and its ideals, like Nomi Marks and Amanita or Meets Kaplan. Do you love it? It kicks ass, like Jean-Claude Van Damme, though you arguably have the hardest life, living in a socio-political situation that is beyond your control and threatens your very survival, the show is every bit the escape you need it to be, like watching a Jean-Claude Van Damme movie, like Kefius... Van Damme, Aniago. Do you like the show a lot and watch it because your friends watch it? Though you might like yourself, or at least your career, a little more, like Lito Rodriguez. Do you watch it because it's your guilty pleasure? It's strange and a little naughty, especially the orgy scenes. It is a far wilder watch than any you've chosen or been brave enough to watch before, like Kala Dandekar. Are you consumed by the show? Almost to an unhealthy point. You've spent a lot of time running away and may have unwittingly run straight toward this, a new possibly unhealthy escapist outlet that gives you a sense of purpose and of belonging, but now it is your whole life, whether that's good for you or not. Like Riley Blue or Will Gorski, are you wary of it, though it too gives you a sense of belonging? Too long you've been a woman in a man's world seeking your own sense of power and agency? Watching this gives you some of that, but also complicates your life in many ways you did not intend, like Sun Bach. Have you recommended this show to many people, though you know that it has flaws? You want as many people to experience it, for better or for worse, and as possible, like Jonas Maliki. Though you try to resist it, you can't help but watch this show, though how much you like it is undecided. 
You know, you at least like a few of the characters, particularly Kala, like Wolfgang Bogdanow. You don't like this show. You vow to snuff it out because it represents anything that threatens you or that you hate. And you were thrilled to hear it was canceled because it made your job easier, like Whispers. Or you stopped watching it because, spoiler, you died, possibly during childbirth, and that's in quotes, like Angelica or Angel Turing. Who would like to start? Hi, I'm Celine. Hi, Celine. Hi. How did I first come to watch Sensate? Well, like a tried and true practice, I discovered it through Tumblr. Thank you very much. And I, honestly, it was a post about language. It was someone posting about how this show had like all of the the translations were done from the original languages to the other ones. Like, I don't know. I just was this post about somebody who was, I think they were German and they were learning, I think, like Korean or something. And they were talking about how, not even like how when one of the characters who was, I don't remember how they, I don't know. I just remember it was an amazing post about how awesome they had done in translating all of these things. And it wasn't just like, from like German to English, it was like German to Korean and, and all like just the way, the multifaceted ways that this show truly cared about the small details and about the language and took to really get the small details right. And I was like, all right, that's cool. That's pretty interesting. Also, this show has lesbians, so let's watch it. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> you know me, <laughs> resident lesbian, <laughs> Tumblr lesbian here. Yes. So that's how I started watching the show and I immediately fell in love. I very much like binged that entire first season, then had to wait for the second season, and then binged the second season. And what kept me watching? Everything. There <laughs> wasn't a thing about the show I didn't like. It was very... I love sci-fi. I love being immersed in new worlds and the like complexity of these concepts and the ideas of having to share everything with other people. I love new concepts, and this was a very new and original concept, and did I watch all of it? Yes, I did. <laughs> and how would I rate my interest in the show? In the beginning, I was definitely uh, Nomi Marks and uh, Amanita Neitz Kaplan, and I still am to this day. Like, it didn't change. I love the show, and I would keep watching it, and... Yeah. All right. Welcome back, Celine. Celine is on several of our panels. <laughs> Usually, if the TV show features a lesbian character, she's on the panel. But she also likes the good place. So what do you know? Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, we're still waiting. <laughs> Hoping, hoping, hoping. Hey, the show keeps... For, for a lesbian on Good Place, or for... What's her name to be a lesbian? Kristen Bell. Yes. <laughs> well, I know she's not a lesbian. <laughs> what if she is? Then my life is great, because she's amazing. <laughs> and but she's I, from Michigan. But I feel bad for... Dak Shepard. Dak Shepard, then, because mm -hmm. he's, he's a good guy. Yeah. And they're adorbs. You know, she could just pull, like, a Kala and... Well, I think... <laughs> is she bisexual? Because... I don't know. Anyway, that's this a whole other thing. This is a whole other <laughs> Sorry. We'll so get back to this podcast. on, on the good Sorry. Course. Welcome back, Celine. And then, who's sitting next to you and talking? Hi, I'm Kelsey. Hi, Kelsey. I'm Celine's fiance. It's true. It Dynamics. is true. <laughs> Dynamics are important. I came to watch this show because one of my siblings was watching it, and they really liked it and recommended it to me. I also, I knew I should have gone before Celine because I'm just gonna be like, everything she said, me too. <laughs> Except the Tumblr thing. Yeah, I fell in love with it immediately. I definitely would say that I loved it, like Amanita and Nomi. Nomi, thanks. And kept loving it. Although I was like reading, scanning through these and I was like, Maybe I'm like Van Damme because I love that it kicks ass. Like I like the whole the action part of it. And then I was like, but I you know living in a socio political situation that's beyond my control and threatens my very survival. That's not me. And then I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> it is. Maybe it. Maybe we're getting there. Anyway, but I really like the show. I also really enjoy sci-fi. I really enjoy the hive mind concept and the spin that this has taken on that because it's not really a hive mind it's something beyond that i think that answers all the questions so you were know me and neats throughout the whole thing yeah i mean i did have a hard time like getting back into it to watch the movie at the end or the season finale but mostly because i wanted to go back and watch everything first and i didn't have time so well you'll have time someday someday someday, <laughs> someday i'll rewatch it all like hmm. binge watch it. Yeah. When Vanessa's good. old enough. Oh, no. <laughs> I don't want to think about when my six and a half year old is old enough to watch this show. <laughs> That's complicated, Celine. Welcome Sorry. back, Kelsey. <laughs> Thank Tell you. 
Kelsey <laughs> appears on a lot of panels with Celine. She's also on our Supernatural panel, and mm -hmm. she's done a vampire show or two. I think it's just the one. Just Vampire just Diaries, vampire I think. Diaries. She likes being here, I hope. I do. <laughs> well, I, I should do. hope so. <laughs> I do. Welcome, Chad. Lovely. <laughs> Thank you. Well, this is Chad. I'm the white male. <laughs> just put that out there, since everybody else is announcing what orientation <laughs> Radio has a representation matters. Yes, <laughs> yes. So, all right. So, I got interested in this show because I was browsing through Netflix new releases that day, and this show popped up, and it's like, oh, this sounds like kind of interesting. And I got hooked in with the the cinematography, the orchestrations. Mm -hmm. It was it looked like it was a first class production. And we get into the story of the hive mind possibility with eight completely different strangers not only from different walks of life but also from around the world and you know different countries speak speaking different languages and that sort of thing and the different skill sets they seem to complement each other so well the, the the character of Sun was especially a surprise because she was the kick-ass street fighter that Caffius aspired to <laughs> and she came in so many times to save his butt <laughs> <laughs> So I was watching it, the serendipitous of being able to watch it. I got hooked right away, and I was waiting for the first, the second season to come out. Uh, I watched it. I thought, oh, this is great. And then I heard it was canceled, and I'm thinking, you bastards. <laughs> yes. yes. You, it's like you can't just leave us there. Can't leave us there on that hook. So I'm glad they Netflix decided to wrap it, everything up as well as they did, and I would like to watch more of this world, especially if it was, say, the other Sensei clusters, mm -hmm. especially with the cantankerous Scottish, <laughs> Scottish <laughs> librarian. Is this the doctor you mean? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes. basically. <laughs> yes. If, yeah, if they had more uh, different Sensei clusters and, you know, focusing on different areas or even different time styles. They can mm -hmm. go back in time and do the cluster do different clusters of different types of lives mm. when they got started. Yeah. That'd be kinda cool. So what are your characters at the beginning and at the end? That's part of our CPU trademark. Where, what's that? <laughs> Which characters were you at the beginning or at the end? I would probably have to say a blend between Wolfgang and Will. Okay. <laughs> so Wolfgang Wolfgang was the one who didn't like it as much. Will was the one who was running away. You, can, you are consumed by this show, almost to an unhealthy point. Yeah, that's, that sounds like it. Okay. <laughs> sounds about right. Okay. Fair enough. Welcome back, Chad. This is Chad's second panel. He first appeared on our Battle Creek panel, which was also a looking back. So this mm -hmm. is going to be kind of your wheelhouse. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the ones that get canceled. Oh. <laughs> what are we going to do a, a, a Firefly episode? Soon, it's up there. Uh, All right, soon. Don't you think that's too soon? <laughs> it's Hashtag always too soon. Always too soon. <laughs> yeah, Netflix, where's our two hour movie of Firefly? <laughs> it was Serenity. Yeah, Serenity. Well, so, they, didn't, they didn't end we it got as well. It's called Serenity. Yeah, yeah they didn't do as well. That is a whole other path. Anyways, which we will But do. it's sci fi, so it relates kind of. Better than The Good Place. <laughs> better than, yes, better than my last tangent. <laughs> So this might happen. <laughs> Sorry. No, it's fine. And my name is Kylie, I mentioned that. And I started watching Sense8 really because actually one of our other CPU panelists who is not here today is was very, very passionate about it, so much so that they chose to write a review. And we actually published a review of the pilot based on that. And then I heard that it got renewed, and then I started to read more about it. And of course, it's created by the Wachowskis, who I'm a big fan of. They made the Matrix trilogy. Now, not all of those movies were good, but the first one was really good. <laughs> <laughs> and V for Vendetta was pretty good, which I also pretty liked good. that one. So they're, I'm very impressed by their sense of high concept storytelling and figured, well, if they could do those, this should be good. I started watching it and was very surprised by how engaged I was in the story right off the bat because of the high concept. I am also a big lover of science fiction. I've watched a lot of science fiction. I've read a lot of science fiction. This is nothing like I've ever read or watched before. So that was good, something truly original. It took me a little while to get into it in the first season, I wasn't hooked right away, but I got there probably by mid-season. I just had to get a feel for the story they were telling, but I was also impressed by 
all the production value, the cinematography, the music, the fact that they did all these locations. I think in the end, <laughs> I would have, I think I would be Kefius. I love it. It kicks ass like Jean-Claude Van Damme. I don't have the hardest life, but I do live in a socio-political situation that is beyond my control. <laughs> so, and the show is a great escape because I think one of the best messages of the show, and we're going to talk about this, is how it emphasizes sort of the love is love is love concept. Mm -hmm. And that hit on a very nice note in the series finale, which we'll also talk about. And that's the kind of messaging I think that needs to be out there right now in these are geo and socio-political times. But we won't get too far into that. <laughs> <laughs> so welcome to the Sensei panel. Now, this is one of our looking backs, but also one of our first looks. Although I'm going to tell you, listeners, secret keeping, we'll put it all out there. You might remember we had an equipment failure <laughs> way back in the winter time, And we had actually, this is our last holdover of the Reduxes. We had a Sensei record, actually a couple of recordings on each season. We're redoing them now, so it's going to be a little bit different, and it's not really our first look, but it's our first look for you. <laughs> <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> and it's going to be a whole new and fun discussion. So now I'm going to ask you to rate the show along the CPU standard star rating scale, or as my sister calls it, Hillary, the star business. And it goes like this. Do you rate the show five stars? You have to watch everything. Holy smokes, is the greatest thing you've ever watched in the history of television. You can't believe it's so amazing. Five stars. Is it four stars? It certainly seemed intriguing and you kept watching, but you were kind of bothered by some pitfalls in the premise. Was it three stars? You maybe watched one season or you went for both, but there were things you liked and things you didn't. You wanted to see which things were allowed to flourish. Was it two stars? You really only could watch part of it. You were mainly bored. There was some intrigue or fascination that held it together, but you really had to struggle to keep watching. Or is it one star? Pass on this one, guys. It's a snoozer. It's not funny. It's not interesting. It's not your cup of tea. There's far, far too many TV options in the world to waste your time on Sense8. One star. Who would like to start? I'll start. I'll give it a five. Okay. Five stars. <laughs> five yes. stars. Oh, wow. Okay. So you must each justify five stars. Go. Well, I mean, any of the pitfalls that I felt that I, like, encountered in the show I think would have been could have been explained given more time like honestly a lot of them were just su such high concepts that they weren't necessarily pitfalls it was just something that I don't think was fully realized yet or they had plans on a you know bringing it up later and they just came up got out of time I don't know I just loved it and I mean like even like slow episodes weren't really slow they just weren't as high paced as the rest of the season which they, they still weren't slow episodes. They just, there was a lot of stuff to explain. Things had to actually happen, so other things could happen. Everything seemed to have a place and a purpose. I just think it was a really well put together show, and I loved it. Yeah, I agree with everything she said, but also I, I think, you know, what, a little bit of what you guys had said before, too, like their attention to detail with language, but also culture and all, everything, and then the cinematography and the scoring and everything. I just think it was all great. I thought five stars for me, but I thought the attention to detail with different sexual concepts where you have the character of Wolfgang, who's very promiscuous, going out for Tinder dates, and, and then you, ha you balance that with Kayla's very, very uptight, kind of virgin, virginal type worried in aspects of that with her culture. You go with uh, Naomi, who's very out and proud, transgender, and even including Leto's closeted status that eventually he, throughout the series, he comes out. And for him, the experience was overwhelmingly positive, but there were also, the, you know, the the consequences of people reacting to that because they built him up as in the in the show as a star of male masculinity and you should always get the girl but actually he was gay and yeah he can't play that part anymore because people know you're gay and they know you're acting and it's like but I'm an actor <laughs> <laughs> they should know I'm acting <laughs> but anyway but yeah it was just that was kind of like the undertone of not only sexual awareness and being comfortable with your sexuality, but also this other concept of, you know, the, the hive mind of the sensates. I 
I don't know if I would have said five stars before the movie. So that's mm -hmm. my my problem with this is that I'm trying to separate my mind from because if I were to rate it right after the beginning, I probably would have given it a four. Mm -hmm. Just just because knowing myself, I was like, ooh, this is really complicated and there's a lot going on and it's really like overlaid weirdly in a way that I didn't understand. But getting into the story and then now because there is an ending and it was a very satisfying ending, I probably would say five stars just because I could recommend this show to somebody and be like, look, this is great. This is unlike you anything you've ever watched in your whole life whatsoever. It's an intelligent show. It's a show that makes you think, makes you feel, has concepts that have been explored, like Kelsey said, in different ways, but not any way like this before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it has a, a satisfying beginning, middle, and end, except for things that didn't ever fully get flushed out. But mm -hmm. they did kind of rush through it in the movie. So that's that's kind of where I am. I'm, maybe I'm at a four and a half place, because I really, really, really like it. All right, so I think a lot of us answered, did we like the show right away? And most of us did. I think I honestly did. It just took a little bit for me to get used to it. Mm -hmm. So now let's talk about what you love and what you hate about it. You can be as general or as specific as you want. You can talk about anything in any of the seasons, anything you want to say. Oh, I stumped them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to think of things that I didn't already say. Okay. Yeah. Because I think, you know, I, I guess I have to think more specifically because I think all of the large concept things that I loved, we've already talked about. I think I loved a lot the going from, you know, just relationships between two people to relationships between not only the sensates, but all of the people connected to the sensates. Like, you know, in the beginning, you just took these eight strangers who suddenly had to deal with other people being in their mind or not real knowing if they were going crazy or not to these eight people plus everyone connected to them. Like, and at the end with the wedding where everybody's all together and just the relationships and how people who had never met before were there and suddenly they were like, this is the spirit of, you know, Van Damme and being able to be like in awe of someone they just met who had, but, but they've been like mentally known that they were thankful for them for what they had done and just the overarching complexity of relationships. And like also what I thought was really cool was in the, in the season finale, the movie, when like Riley was suddenly speaking to River and River I it was it took me until after the movie was done to realize that River didn't actually see who she was talking to because she's a human and she had to have the other sensei or the other person talking to her to let her know what was happening and just the entire the in the complexities and the awesomeness of it all and I I just loved it I like the sense of community I think mm -hmm. that what this show did really, really well is not only show us different walks of life, different types of humans, but the fact that we're really all part of one big community, a global, big, worldly community. And it was a sensitive way of really depicting that just because we do have differences, we're really more alike than we are different. But it also showed the other half of that where there were other sensei, sensei clusters that really weren't working for the common good at all. They had people that were working for Whispers as well. And well, and clusters who were working against each other mm -hmm. as well, instead of... And clusters that actually didn't get along at all. I guess they ended up fracturing and destroying each other. Mm -hmm. Well, because they're still all ultimately human, right? Yeah. I mean, it isn't a shiny, happy, utopian thing right. we watched. Right. Mm -hmm. No. There's still, you know, roots of evil. There are two different types of humans, homo sapien, homo sensorium. Yeah. Yeah, so you're right, though. One thing that I was slightly confused on sure. by the end was the lacuna. Well, that was like a really last minute 13th hour introduction of something that really merited a lot more exploration. <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> and, like, <laughs> it was cool, and I'm really intrigued by the concept, but I would Spin really. Off. Spin off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That'd be cool. Moreover, like the entire point of, I guess, the lacuna, with the exception of being like, you need to get rid of whispers. This has to happen. Well, and she was whispers sensei. Yes. Her, so it just there was gravity in her pro proclamation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But you know, you're absolutely right. That scene was somewhat confusing because I was trying to. It was very ethereally mm -hmm. presented, and I could not figure out. 
why I was supposed to care with, for the woman with the tattoo on her head. Yeah. Besides that her tattoo was awesome. It was yeah. very awesome. <laughs> that tattoo. was the first thing I said when I saw her. I was like, I want that tattoo. <laughs> that really that would hurt a lot. Yeah, that would hurt. And you have to be bald all the time for it to work. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, or it's like your secret tattoo that you know you have. I don't know. <laughs> That's true. It only comes out in summer, it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, there was obviously a significance to that character, and yeah. it took a while to get to what that significance was. Right, and then because they were talking as they were in their sensate realm where they were sharing this experience, but this experience wasn't really part of the world that they were in. They yeah. were in mm -hmm. some sort of weird, I guess... In-between place, yeah. a liminal place, maybe? Yeah, some kind of other dimension, if you will. Yeah, it, which was all... Yeah, that's like a heavy thing to bring in... At such a late at hour. At such a late hour, yeah. An altered state of reality. Well, and then she meant... The mother mentioned something about being... Something about, like, of the body, or was it of the mind... I don't know. Like, I wasn't sure if she actually still had a body or if she was just in this liminal space. Well, that was one of the questions that I've had all throughout because we have seen repeatedly flashbacks of Angelica. Mm -hmm. But then there are times when Jonas appears and, and she's still there. Is still, still there. Mm -hmm. So is it something where a homo sensorium's consciousness, if you will, transcends their, you know... Well, mm -hmm. yeah, because didn't... They showed Angelica at the wedding in the end, too, didn't they? Because I remember being like, wait, well, she's dead, right? Like, she's <laughs> really not alive anymore. I there was so. like well, she definitely a brief... showed up when Jonas was she getting was... ready to blow up. Well, in all fairness, and it's a very, uh, how do you say their name? Wachowski's. Wachowski mm -hmm. concept, because they do it a lot. In, like, they did in V for Vendetta, where all the dead people are suddenly taking off masks, but that was a whole different concept. That was symbolic. But, yeah, I know, well, maybe that is too. Like, with, I, with well, see, Angelica being there. Like, yeah, that's is she what really I there? always wonder. Whenever it's with Jonas, I'm like, okay, is she, is her consciousness really present, or is this us is seeing there. that he's Or is it the concept that even though there, a or, sensate is dead physically, can they still haunt the person? Be there mentally with them? Right. Or are they just That's a ghost friend. ghost in a shell? Well, and, I, and for a second, I thought we had almost found the answer to that in the movie when we thought Kala died, and then she wasn't really dead, and I was like, oh, well, I'm glad you're not really dead, but <laughs> that was going to answer my question. I was like, no, they can't kill someone. <laughs> I know. Well, yeah, as soon as that happened, I was like, how many more are going to die now? Right. Like, well, and at first, during that scene, all the other people were dying, or not dying, getting shot, and I was like, no, not all the, not, no. All like, the side kids. I don't want all the human people to die, so that, like, it was so conflicted, and then they didn't die, and I was very happy. Yeah. That was good. So who are some of your favorite characters? I have a special part in my heart for Riley Blue. <laughs> also, also Sunbok, but... In a crush way, or... Because you said it in your crush voice. You did. Well. <laughs> you did. <laughs> kind of. I don't know. I think during the first season, I had such a love for Riley because she's so... Sent, like, she she is so broken in such, like, a way because, you know, she's using the drugs to try and get rid of all of that pain and sadness and the, you know, the with her husband and her baby dying and and just dealing with everything in life that has gone wrong for her and still managing to like pull through and getting back up and even though it takes her such a long time she does it and it's just such a human I don't I have such a love for broken characters it's <laughs> so you know my love for her is comes from her being such a broken person when we find her for initially in the first part and then my love for Sun is because she's just so badass and you know kind of sticking it to the patriarchy, even though she gives into it for so much of it, she always ends up fighting it again in the end. Like, she might bend a little bit, but it's only so that she gets a better kick eventually. Sun is my <clears throat> favorite character of the eight. I really, really enjoy her. It's because I think she represents not only an answer to a cultural stereotype, mm -hmm. but also that sense of feminist empowerment, if you will. She is able to fight the patriarchy. <laughs> when the patriarchy is exemplified by her own father, you know, and her brother, mm -hmm. and in many ways she has so many disadvantages, but also broken, another broken mm -hmm. character, so there you go. <laughs> but who does claw her way back from that, that broken place, and, 
in such a compelling way. And I, I do love, Chad mentioned earlier, the whole Spirit of Van Damme concept. I love that pairing, the mm -hmm. two of them particularly, mm -hmm. just because they are both so different, and even so different personalities. Son is, you know, very reserved and very strong and very kind of stalwart and Kefius is so ebullient and <laughs> enthusiastic, and but also ultimately moved to do the right thing, mm -hmm. and as they all are in their way. And so she's just my favorite. Every time she comes on the screen and does fights and kicks ass, I'm like awesome. And plus, her relationship with the detective whose name I don't remember. Moon. 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 Oh, so the sun and moon. Oh, that's right. <laughs> I didn't even realize that. We just realized it on the way over here. We're reading the talking points, and we're like sun and moon. Ah. Oh, oh. <laughs> So they're so adorable. Mm -hmm. yeah. I just love them so much. Their flirting is like Oh, kill me now. <laughs> well, when he shows up unexpectedly in Paris, yes. of all things, it's like, oh, that's just like the cutest thing uh, ever. And, and it's because she wouldn't throw away the burner phone even though she knew it could be tracked, yeah. which is like, just adds. It's like, adds I'm that. just leaving you a bed breadcrumb just to follow me. Right. <laughs> right. I love that. The, the, Victorian, the Victorian equivalent of dropping a hanky. <laughs> My favorite characters have always been Nomi and Meats, I think. And Bug. I love yeah, Bug. He so funny. much. He has a lot of comic relief. He does. In the right places. Right. And that scene at the wedding when he walked Nomi down the aisle and he said, like, they were talking about being each other's family and that was just really sweet. I just cried the entire wedding scene. Oh, yeah. For sure. Even when the... Naomi's mom got high on brownies. Uh, that's what we were <laughs> trying to figure out. <laughs> because I was like, they definitely hint that those are pot brownies, but yeah. those are giant pot brownies. <laughs> pot brownies. And also, like, everybody else was eating them so, like, freely that I was like, how is everyone not just paralyzed and on the floor? Like, <laughs> we were trying to figure that out. I see. I Here's what I thought of in the end because obviously when we meet Nomi for the very first time they're trying to lobotomize her almost mm -hmm. in parallel to what BPO does to the sensei mm -hmm. but it's because mom does not want Nomi to gender reassign right yeah. she, she's very very against Michael she keeps calling her Michael regarding her transition and so I was really questioning if it was a pot brownie, we're on the finale a lot, and that makes sense because we all watched it very recently. <laughs> I kept wondering, is that really a pot brownie? And then how much of her, because mom does come up to Nomi and says, Nomi, Nomi, that's such yeah. a beautiful name. Like, oh, is she really okay with that now? Like, did having the pot, did she really not have these inhibitions this whole time and she was putting on a really despicable act and the pot brownie stripped her of her inhibitions or did she actually make that brain change along the way where she's now okay with Michael is now know me or what? You know, I don't know and I was talking to Celine about that too because to me that was such a weird twist yeah. to have her parents at her wedding to mm -hmm. begin with like it's it just seemed so out of character that it made me feel like there must have been something that happened you know I mean I know her sister was with them so possibly her sister's been doing some work on that on the side that we missed well, well we also see that her dad is much more okay with it like right. in the her, second season when they do go to sister's, to the sister's, wedding. sister's wedding yes yeah he does finally stand up to mom and say look you just drove our daughter away yeah and doesn't even say anything about son so yeah that's true that's true so I think maybe those two had been working their family dynamics. I think the green and blue fairy intentionally had a special plate for mom and dad. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> I asked maybe Celine if we could have green and blue fairies at our wedding, but I don't think they'd fit our motif that we're going for. As so. drag queens or just regular fairies? <laughs> I was hoping as drag queens. Oh, okay. But, yeah. Fair enough. It wouldn't fit your theme. I just, no, it wouldn't. But that wedding was just awesome. Yeah. It was On so the cool. Eiffel Tower? Yes. I know. Yeah. Yeah. That's like the best wedding ever. <laughs> Seriously. I don't think you can top that. And then their vows, too. Especially Neat's, Neat's vows. Just like. Crushed now, me. this is the same woman who played Martha on Doctor 
Who? Yeah. I know. Can we talk about that? Because Martha, <laughs> maybe it's just the writing was such an empty character. But it was so cool to see Freema tackle something with so much more substance. And on top of that, she she's straight. Mm-hmm. But she did such a great job invoking that chemistry and that I have had to Google several times, like, are you sure she's not at least bisexual? <laughs> because she's also going to be in Colette, right? Is she in that? I don't the know. The new I Colette movie? I think she is. And so I was like, okay, has she just, like, found her niche now? Yeah, and, and I know she expressed, like, nervousness about playing that part. And I just, like, kudos to her. I think she really did she it. She did a phenomenal just job. Amazing. So sincere, so yeah. loving. You really felt that they loved each other so much. Yeah. And, of course, we. I think we would... It may sound like, you know, lip service, but it's not. I think it's stunning that they had a transgender character playing, or it, played by a transgender character. I was actor. just going to say that. Yeah. I've, I've been wanting to say that this whole time, but I was trying to find a good segue. Segway. Yeah, <laughs> but I think this is a good one, like, to have... And I just think that goes back to their attention to detail, too, and trying to and doing it the right way, you right. know? To well, have, and that's I a mean, very lived experience by the Wachowskis, yeah, too. Exactly. So I think... Right. It was personal for them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Which is also cool. It was also cool. Well, I would have to say that my f- character I identified with would be no surprise, Will. <laughs> Why do you say it like that? <laughs> the straight white, straight white man. Straight white, <laughs> straight white man from the Midwest, Grand Rapids yeah. and Chicago are not too far away from each other. That's true. All of a sudden, he gets he's got this normal job being a Chicago police police officer and all of a sudden these weird things start happening and it just blows up into his getting captured by whispers being the method that whispers infiltrates his sensate cluster and i also enjoyed the the sacrifice he also employed to basically be a drug addict in amsterdam yeah. As as what he said, the longest stakeout he's ever been on to, <laughs> to trick whispers and to reveal his location. So oh, yeah, Time that was such a cool two. twist. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, like, because yeah, you didn't know that they were in a completely different location. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that and so he cool. basically he was his personal character sacrifice of missing his father being estranged from his father at the, during that time, his father not even knowing what's going on, and he's in such poor health. And so, and he's the personal battle of battling addiction, too. So once you get on that road, it's you've got a whole another set of problems. Yeah. I mean, there's, I, I think there's really something for everybody in this show. Which I is was just going to so toss cool. out that I found him attractive. <laughs> 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 I like Will. Mm-hmm. Some people like Wolfgang. Some people like Wolf. Wolfgang is the bad boy <laughs> of the group. Yes. Yes. He was all, he was too bad. He was he was over the line. For See, me. if I had to like if I had to pick a guy, I would have picked Jonas personally. I have always I found his, that actor attractive since Lost. I just think he's Agreed, but I can't think of him as anyone else but Saeed. It's yeah, it is matter. that is really hard. But I do think I don't know. I think he did do a really good job. He did a great different, job. like yeah. he was definitely a different character, but yes, you just You can't help it. If you've Sounds watched all of Lost, you just blood. get yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And Having you, never watched Lost, I thought oh it was my great. Gosh, mm-hmm. you have to watch Lost and then you can be mad at and then we'll talk on a podcast. Oh yeah, we oh. should I would watch Lost with you again. Oh my gosh. Let's watch, watch it. it again together. Okay. 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 New plans. I want it because I want to witness what a new person going through it looks like. <laughs> <laughs> It's a very controversial show. It's like, show. Oh, oh, here comes a twist. Let's look at her face. Let's videotape this. I oh, right. I, mean, ah! I had a friend who wanted to do that for a different movie. We yes. were on a TV show. What was it? Dollhouse. She wanted to record my reactions to Dollhouse. Oh. Have you watched Dollhouse? I watched the first season of Dollhouse. Oh, you should watch the second season. Yeah, I, see, I haven't seen any of it. You see the reaction so videos from people doing yeah. a Game of Thrones okay, show. you now have to watch Dollhouse. Oh, God. I told you we should. Uh, there's Long story lots short. of girls on Dollhouse. I know. Okay. I know. <laughs> Trust including me. Eliza, including Eliza Dushku. And Dyken Le- uh, Leachin. I don't know. Dyken Lachman. That one. <laughs> <laughs> That's I don't cute. know how to say her name. She's just pretty. She's <laughs> Anya in The Hundred. <laughs> she died too early. Spoiler for The Hundred, which is a podcast we used to do till you jump the shark. Sorry. <laughs> 
Sorry, not sorry. <laughs> but back to Jonas. I was really pissed that I never <laughs> knew what side he was on. I was oh, always, yeah. I want, I don't, do I, I, mm, I was very frustrated not knowing how I felt about well, him because I wanted to believe he was good and then he kept doing bad things and then I was like, but, but, but. I'm glad that you felt that way because I was worried that I wanted to believe he was good just because I loved Saeed from Lost so much. <laughs> I was just like, maybe that's why I want him to be a good guy. No, so. I, just, I never really got the sense that he was really bad. He was far too present in their lives and we didn't see him as much with Whispers and BPO. Mm -hmm. And also, his connection with Angelica seemed to be the most real thing about him. Mm -hmm. yeah. That I couldn't my brain couldn't even buy that he was possibly evil. Well, I mean, yes, but there was also that time I, during season two we weren't sure that Angelica was good. Yeah. And that... I never actually was convinced by that either. Well, I wasn't convinced. <laughs> but, but it was, was still like those doubt. seeds of Like, doubt. you know, that's always yeah. that thing where, you know, the second you hear something, you're like, I still think you're good. But you could be bad. It doesn't seem right, but it could be. I always be. got kind of chaotic neutral vibes from Jonas, personally. Yeah. Mostly leaning toward good, but like, every once in a while I was like, mm, if this benefits him more, he might make that choice instead of for the hive. I was never sure. And I, well, yeah, and it, it was hard to understand the dynamics of Angelica's clusters. Mm -hmm. She had mm -hmm. more than one. Yeah. She birthed more than one. Mm -hmm. So it was hard to figure out, I think in the end, what, what she was really trying to do. Was she protecting her and Jonas because they loved each other? Was she protecting her children? Was she protecting something else? We knew that whispers could go bad, but whispers, so let's talk about whispers. What do we think about whispers as the villain, played by Terrence Mann, of course? I think he's a very good villain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I never liked him. <laughs> so success, success. success. I mean, yeah, he did a great job at it, being somebody I hated. Yes. Yeah, it's just this bright blend of swarminess. Yeah, yeah. Well, in that scene, I mean, this is again going back to the finale, but that scene where he, Will confronts him oh, and is like, well, "I don't know how you could do the things he did to what's that girl's name." That Sarah. The missing girl. Yeah, Sarah. How you could do those things to Sarah and then look at another little girl, his oh, daughter. Right, right. And, you know, mm -hmm. like that whole monologue and scene in general. And Whisper's reaction was just, ugh. He creeps me out. He was but, like, a few scenes later with Neitz and Daniela was so <laughs> badass. I know, back to the movie, but... Shoot, I didn't think I liked Daniela that I much. I didn't like her at all in season <laughs> one, and by the third season, I was like, hell <laughs> yeah. Blow that chopper up. <laughs> <laughs> Wolfgang's just do it, do it, do it, do it, do it. That's <laughs> really jumping ahead. Save that moment. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, that was so great. Well, yeah, but like dumping back to season one and the entire unfolding of Lido and Hernando uh -huh. and... Daniela was just so... I, at first, I was like, so... I hated Daniela. It's like, you're just ruining everything for everyone. You're just trying to force your beard shit on them. You're <laughs> just <laughs> ruining it, and it's all because you enjoy watching them. Stop it! <laughs> and then by season two, I was like, oh, I just kind of like her. She's kind of cool. Like, it's not as... So are weird. they polyamory? I, yes. Okay. Because def they're definitely all having sex together. It's yeah. not just those two having sex it's and not watching It's not just the anymore. orgy, just catching on. Uh, can we briefly <laughs> talk about the orgies? orgies. <laughs> yeah. I'm slightly confused. Okay. In, well, particularly in the movie, it seemed that when they were having, like, sensei jump scenes, like, when they were all in the car, or they were all traveling listening to the song. The Depeche Mode song. Yeah. Yes. There was a moment where, like, they would go from being in the, the van sh or the, the bus showing you what was actually happening to in the sensei spot. And I swear to God, Moon was in one of the sensei things going, like, rocking out. They were all. All the but, partners but and all the senseis. Do the partners suddenly, like, in the sensei? That's where I'm confused because it happens a lot in the orgies, too, where everyone is suddenly in the orgy thing. And... 
I'm confused. The first orgy if, was definitely just the cluster. Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm, but I don't slowly, know. If, yeah, I don't know. If well, you know, inferring. they say in sex ed, when you have sex with somebody, you're having sex with everybody else they've ever had sex with. So maybe it was just a... It's a logical step. <laughs> That's, it's just well, there. And then... It could just be the visual representation of, remember, they also share skills and abilities. Well, yes. <laughs> Especially well, also, strong emotions and interactions. So, so I guess my question is, is do the partners also share in with it, or is it literally just the fact that in the sensei high mind spot, because they're all their self, but everyone at the same time, is it just their sensate hive mind including the rest of the partners, or is it all of the partners also experiencing in on all of it? Because I, I, I would say they that get a little bit of the experience because, Rajin, because they're all connected. At the end. But the non-sensate partners, they're just there just because they're in the sensate's minds. That they're, they don't get any of that hive mind mentality. But I was confused I because way. Rajan yeah. at the end, I mean, and I know this could simply be because he didn't imagine having sex with a man would also be great. Being like, oh my God. But then it went, when he, like, when they pulled him back down, it showed all of them there. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't sure if he was also experiencing it or not. I believe that <laughs> because... I think it's a visual representation of when you have sex, it's such an intimacy. Mm -hmm. It's not just physical intimacy, it's emotional, mental, spiritual intimacy. I think it's just a natural extension of the dialogue of all the love and connection mm -hmm. that when they're connected with their partner, but they're also sensate connected with all their cluster and they were all having sex at the same time. It was like a perfect storm mm -hmm. of sexual intimacy that did actually affect the partners that they were with at the time, plus Rajan having his eye-opening new experience. Okay. Also, <laughs> Rajan is so good. He's so... He's such an understanding guy. He's... Yeah. Holy cow. I've spent three seasons or two seasons in a movie being like, no, Kyle is going to break your heart. You're such a innocent human being. Except for the corruption part. Well, I mean, yeah, <laughs> but I feel like that's not... I feel like that wasn't his whole story. No, I also feel like that's an extension of family throwing down on him. Like I feel like if he could not be in it, he would not be in it. And I feel like that's something that if the show had extended series yeah. would have become a story arc, like him having to deal with not wanting to be a part of that pharmaceutical thing, especially now that he knows about the sensates and he knows about Kafias and all of the things happening in Nairobi and particularly, I can't think of the name of that, that sp particular section of Nairobi that Kafias is in. Yeah, I, can't I can't think of it either. The last podcast, I went on a whole tangent about that. You sure I, did. <laughs> you know, knowing that now he's seeing the effects of what the corruption within the company that he is someday taking over, or did his dad die? Is that, I don't remember if he's now a head of the company or not. I think he's the head of the company. I don't think it's because Dad died. Okay. Like retired or something. Yeah, I think he just... I just remember there was a season one they were trying to kill his dad or someone was trying to and... Yeah, yeah. there were yes. warring I just families don't remember if business, he's dead or right? not now. There were warring families yeah. over the business and there was religious yeah. tones to it. Yeah. Right. And that's why the, the marriage between... With Kala was such an important mm -hmm. aspect yeah. of that. Because they were arranged, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. which was part of her. Even though all of the relationships are kind of compelling in their own way, I was probably less invested in Lido and Hernando, mm -hmm. and probably more invested in well, Sun and Moon, no, <laughs> yeah, and Moon. but also Kala and Rajan and Wolfgang because. That was a very interesting juxtaposition to put somebody who is very traditionally Hindu, very traditionally, you use the word virginal, <laughs> yeah. just somebody very straight-laced and not sexually experimental, mm -hmm. to who's arranged in a marriage with a man she's not even sure she loves, to discover Wolfgang and then suddenly, in the throes of passion, find love. I thought that was a very interesting and unique way to bring about that topic too in like today's stuff about the the differences between arranged marriages versus love at quote unquote first sight and the difference between you know like 
what is sexual love versus learned love and how she learns to love both like she loves both of them in their own right at, mm-hmm. by the end of the movie and neither way is right nor wrong how it's it's just a and topic then, that and then you have that also contrasted with nomi and neats who sort of had a love at first sight thing they did mm-hmm. have a love so at you know that's I don't, it's it, it's a cool commentary on because I think at least for me growing up so much of it, you know romance was the love at first sight thing was romanticized and, and Thank you, Disney. made you think like that's the best way and possibly only way to feel well, and to fall in love. The whole thing with Kala and Wolfgang, I think they kind of at the end they kind of drew it back a little bit. Yes, Wolfgang loves Naomi and Naomi loves Wolfgang. But Naomi Maybe also. Kala. Kala, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Kala, sorry. <laughs> really? Kala. But there's this weird three way relationship, but Wolfgang pulls back a little bit because Kala's married to somebody else. Mm-hmm. But I thought the funniest part about them showing that is when Kala is trying to explain to her husband how to use a gun. And she, doesn't, and she probably doesn't have any more clue than he does. The husband does, and then it's Wolfgang that comes in. It just basically goes over the, the, the basics of point safety, point shoot, squeeze. Yeah, <laughs> and the, like the bromance between Rajan and Wolfgang is so beautiful and unique because like Wolfgang immediately knows who Rajan is. He's like, this is my competition, but he doesn't view it that way. He's like, he's a good guy who's been taking care of Kala and. Also, the moment where Rajan, in the second season, where he falls in her... Well, it's an entirely complicated (laughs) relationship. It's a completely complicated relationship. And when they had Wolfgang show up at Kala's, basically, wedding, and he's basically nude because he's in a sauna, (laughs) it just... Just really, just like, just throws just everything. Just like, this was not scripted. This was not, a, that, that, this is not supposed to happen. <laughs> I think that we spent a lot of time last time talking about, like, was there something in his contract that said he had to be nude so many times in the season? Like, because he was just he was naked, naked all the time. time. And, yeah, all just in full frontal nudity. And it's like, Okay, they're not afraid to go there. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. They're European. They do that all the time. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean... Yeah. It's well, diff- and they did it with Freema a little bit, too, mm-hmm. which was... Well, know. they did not shy away from any of the sex, whether right. it was no. individual or orgy. Also, <laughs> the fact that this show ended on a shot of a dildo. A strap-on. <laughs> she, okay, first of all, Celine, <laughs> this orgy's happening, and she goes... They're not going to end it here, and I was like, "Oh yes, they are. <laughs> That's exactly how they're going to end. It's perfect." That's why and then that famous, happened. Actually, <laughs> right. people started watching the show on because the internet of the... because of the rumors of the origin scenes. Well, and I liked it because it kind of started with that. It did. Too. It started with the strap on, and it ended with the strap on. <laughs> No, that's right. <laughs> it's <laughs> like, here's a shocking image. If you can't handle this, don't watch the rest of the show. Yeah, it's like, okay, this is not age appropriate for... <laughs> right, yeah, my six and a half year old will not be watching this. <laughs> <laughs> this is TVMA. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That's it, right in the it, it, yeah. Yeah. I kind of wish they would give you a little bit more brief description as to why it's TVMA. Well. Yeah, kind of like a... It has this, this, and this. And it's like, okay, thanks. Sense8 has all of it. Yeah, <laughs> basically. Yeah. All the things that make it M.A. Yeah, man. <laughs> it has the violence. It has the language. It's got the sex. It's got all of it. Mm-hmm. So a couple of other things I want to cover from a high level. First of all, the use of music in this show. Mm-hmm. And the first season, the Four Non Blondes, What's Up, was a recurring song. I forgot what the second season's major thematic song was, and then of course the movie had the Depeche Mode. No, I can't remember what it's called. You have it in the talk. Internet course. to the rescue here. I think I just said a Depeche Mode song. <laughs> you might have. I think she did too. Uh-huh. I might have stumbled over while I was reading it out loud. She did. She didn't know how to say Depeche. <laughs> it doesn't say which one, oh sorry. Oh my gosh. Anyway, very important, I mean, very omnipresent use of music, starting with the fact that Riley is, in fact, a DJ mm-hmm. in Iceland, and her dad is a musician. But everybody, one of the wonderful themes that I think is brought out is how music is a common, a, a uniting yeah. language, mm-hmm. which I have always been a fan of and I've always said and I've always championed, and mm-hmm. they really made that practical and artistically wonderful in this show. Mm-hmm. The theme song, though. Yeah, the theme so song good. Is really good. Beautiful. Yeah. And 
compositionally really kind of actually complex. I don't know if you yeah. listen to it. That yeah. I'm like, hmm, there's a lot of instrumentation going on in there, and they're all doing all different things. Yeah. Because that's how I listen to stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Well, and then there's that, that there's that episode when she, when Riley's back in Iceland with her dad's at, when her dad's at the symphony and they they there's that entire mind blowing scene where they're all uh, I can't even describe feeling it. Feeling her emotion. They're all feeling her emotion. They're all experiencing like I want to say it was like wasn't it the, like their birth scenes or something like there was all of that emotional stuff happening while she's at the symphony. And I am someone who's very musically oriented. I am a sound person for theater, and I was just in tears that entire scene. I could not. You're almost in tears right now. I know. <laughs> it's I Feel You? Mm -hmm. Okay. Internet to the rescue. Yay! Thank you, Internet. Thank you, Internet. I mean, I'm actually a Depeche Mode fan, but I, I admit as I get older, I'm starting to lose things like, what's that song called again? <laughs> Oh, that's a great song. <laughs> so I just wanted to point that out because mm -hmm. music to me is so important. And it is actually one of the things I noticed very first about TV or movies that I'm watching is how are they using the music because a well-placed song or a bit of scoring that it, it can make the whole thing iconic mm -hmm. all by itself. And Sensei and I thought did that so well. Mm -hmm. And they have such a great use of source music in the show, too. It's not just music for us. It's music for the characters. And, like, even in season one, the very first time Riley and Will are kind of crossing over on each other when Will keeps, like, bursting out of his room to yell at his neighbor who he thinks is playing really loud music. The and neighbor it's just that's him not there. Riley. <laughs> yeah. And, like, the second he exits his room, he's like, what, what? And then he goes back in, and he's suddenly in at Riley's show again in his mind, and it's just so well done. It's so beautifully done. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The other thing I wanted to talk about was the recasting of Kafias. It was Amalameen, and then... I honestly don't really remember Amalameen anymore, but I'm glad that they recast him if, you know, he was saying... Well, according to Jamie Clayton, he was. Yeah. She would heard it. She would know. Mm -hmm. so. And for those of you at home, apparently the first actor playing Kafias was making unkind uh, unkind remarks about trans transgender people. Mm -hmm. Yes. Which does not fly when A, one of the main cast is transgender, and B, the creators of the show are transgender. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I mean, that's got to be like the worst career move in the history of career moves. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. And I remember like before I realized why they had recast, because I wasn't keeping up so much with what was going on in the show until the second season came out, and I was just like, oh, new season, and then, and then it was a different actor, and I was like, wait, what? Yeah. And at first I was kind of mad, because I thought the the first actor was very good as Kafias, but the second one was just as good as that. Like, really good. they're such. He's so adorable, and I love him so much. Like the little teddy bear. Kafias <laughs> is just such a happy guy, a happy person, and in he's a world so. Where he, I mean, he could easily not be happy because yeah. he's in the middle of Nairobi, which is mm -hmm. third world. Yeah, I mean, one of the most. I would say innocent characters of them all. He he he's got this. He just wants to drive his bus, and all of a sudden he starts getting wrapped up in all these intrigues with the politi local political situation. Well, they're fighting over drinking water there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I mean that's. I thought that was actually a brilliant masterstroke to include that story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very real story that's going on that does not get American press because of American press. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there is the Clean Water Project and all these other things because it's a real thing. People are jacking up prices just to have water to drink and to, to eat and to clean with. But I do love the fact that they, for all of the characters, they kind of have sort of something that made them stand out from the environment that they were traditionally mm -hmm. in, which was interesting to me. And he's no exception, but I do love Toby. I thought he did, I did the same thing, like, wait a minute. That's a new guy. Yeah. <laughs> so then I got on the internet. Mm -hmm. I went to Twitter and I went to Jamie Clayton's account. And yeah, she went on a fairly multi part <laughs> <laughs> tweeting rampage on it. Yes, this is true. Yes, it happened. We're moving on. Enjoy season two. And we're not going to talk about it anymore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> so that's really sad. But also, I. 
I agree. I think Toby did a really great job, and it didn't miss a beat. Talking about that character, Kafius's character, though, the fact that his mom started dating the drug lord that he somehow got bamboozled into trying to protect in the first season was a nice twist and interesting mm -hmm. <laughs> side was. story. <laughs> I think they're still together, aren't they? Yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's that's a story I would have liked to have seen more of mm -hmm. uh -huh. if the show hadn't been canceled. I mean, whoa. Anyway, so now, I don't know if there's anything else you want to say about the show. We have talked a lot about the series finale, but now let's approach the series finale from was it a proper send-off for the show? I think so. Given that the show was already canceled and it wasn't like they could lead the seeds up to it, prior. I think they did a really good job of wrapping up the story without leaving too much left unturned. And I really liked that it didn't just end when they killed Milton or Whispers. I liked that it was about ending on a happy note and seeing them all mm -hmm. get a chance to have one last big, you know, like actual in life get together with their friends and to have all of the people who knew that they were sensate be together at a wedding mm -hmm. and then get to go on from there. I thought they tied it up neatly, wrapped it up with a nice bow, and gave it to us. And, and then it ended on a, on a literal for our fans. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, they got me right in the feels. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, that's me. <laughs> I am you. I am our fans. <laughs> yes, it wrapped up the major plot points. The Naomi was able to get married, she was able to get recognition from her parents, mm -hmm. especially her mother, of her, their, her situation. Son, she's no longer in jail, in prison, in South Korea for embezzling because her brother was a jerk and, embe and, and embezzled money and you know Deserves threw her under the bus it. there's still other things that are that could be that's not resolved so, such as you know will will he be able to go back to the chicago police department i mean he was gone for probably over a year i don't know i think he's gone chad i think they can <laughs> yeah <laughs> but will he be able to go back to his life? Does he will, want to go will back he, to his Will life? he want to go back to his life? Will yeah. any of them want to go? I think he actually asked mm -hmm. that question, Will does, in the series. Well, Caffius will probably want to go back to Nairobi. 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 <laughs> Nairobi. He's still in the race for he, being He's a still candidate. being a political candidate now, but what he knows about the, you know, altering of prescription medications, will that, will that, that's also kind of, brings in Kala. I mean, mm -hmm. th that, that's a source of tension right there because the company Kala works for is supposedly supplying some of these medications that don't meet the standards. So, th I mean, if we went on, we could explore more of those. Yeah. But, you know. So you feel like there's a lot of lingering questions. There's there's always more lingering questions, <laughs> but we got the the major plot points resolved. Whispers is dead. Yeah. We have okay. a few happy endings. Now you can talk well, about we... blowing up the helicopter. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Yeah. yeah, but will Whispers still be Whispers could still be, you know, a ghost in Will's head. Like Angelica. Why like Angelica and Jonas is, you know, still kicking around in other people's skulls. I mean, he could be kind of like this devil on Will's shoulder, you know, kind of pointing like, you want to go do it? You want to do the bad thing? You want to do the bad thing? Is that how we sometimes hear that little voice in our head, but now we have a kind of a personification for it? Well, I mean, in all good stories, every revolution ends mm -hmm. and begins another one. There's mm -hmm. always, yeah, now that River's in charge again, for real, at BPO, we have our Scottish doctor, Hoy, <laughs> Mr. Hoy, you know, he's allowed to be out again. <laughs> right. He is allowed to be out again. You know, all of the... We've hardly talked about BPO or the chairman, who we, I guess we sort of met, but I don't really know if I was satisfied with... Yeah, that was... I, I mean, was like, I who's know. that guy? Are we supposed to know him? Not until the movie. Yeah. I don't know if, you know, the fact that we know who he is was ever really an important part. I think the fact that... It's just another face trying to behind, them. you know, a corporation. Does it really matter who the person behind the corporation is if the corporation is still doing bad things? It yeah. sort of mattered to me only in the sense that of all the complicated things in this story, of mm -hmm. all the complexities as you were talking about, one of the things, this is one of the actually deteriorating or less, thing, less things that I didn't like as much. Mm -hmm. 
was they oversimplified the corporation, in my okay. estimation. Like, they were really just an evil face. High concept villain that had no structure, no foundation. All we knew is that they were experimenting and on and eliminating Homo Sensorium, and Whispers was helping them because he wants to live forever. That's it. It felt to me that Whispers was really the head of it. I mean, like, I know the chairman was hypothetically really the head of it, but it seemed like Milton was the brains. He was the... I think he was the manipulator. Yeah. I think he was manipulating the corporation for his own gains. And I and think the chairman... was to have all of the consciousnesses of all of the sen sensates in all, in all over the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm which makes him the villain, the perfect villain that we were talking about. But they spent such a large time, especially in season two, on BPO, that it's kind of like the island and lost. It became its own character, in a sense. Mm -hmm. And I just felt a little not satisfied with where we landed on it. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's fair. Something we could have had in season three. Yeah. <laughs> true. I mean, in true, yeah. How about you? Do you think the finale was a proper send-off? Yeah, it's a good consolation prize. I mean, I would have liked more seasons, but yeah, I do think it wrapped things up satisfactorily, and we got to see at least what happens to the characters in the near future, because there's always, there's always more, more story because they live on. Were you surprised by the cancellation? Why or why not? Did the show deserve to be canceled? Why or why not? No. Yes and no. No, mm -hmm. the show did not deserve to no. be canceled. And yes, I was very surprised. Mm -hmm. I was too. Although I, I guess I wasn't surprised in the sense that I every time I watched it, I was like, this show has to be so expensive to put on. But it seemed so worth it to me that I was hoping that they would continue. Mm -hmm. I mean, Netflix okay. wanted to really be a contender in the television market mm -hmm. and it's like oh they're, they're really putting a lot of money into this they're this is a serious contender and then i got liking it and then they decided to cancel it and it's like thanks a lot netflix <laughs> right yeah. so it makes me question so i'm thinking to myself because netflix is really a wild card they're kind of right now the drivers on the tv industry mm -hmm. everybody's yeah. trying to be like them even the major networks at this point mm -hmm. So the question really becomes, you know, what is that going to look like in the end? They had what could be tantamount to a risky concept. There was a lot of different types of characters that were clearly not striving for demographics or anything. Mm -hmm. Actually, I think they were just hoping to get as many different people to watch it as possible. They did throw a lot of money at it, mm -hmm. especially with all the location yeah. shooting. But then only to let it go for a couple of years, especially when it was critically acclaimed and popularly acclaimed. Maybe they didn't have the numbers to justify, but that to me starts to make me wonder then about the other stuff that Netflix produces originally and what exactly is their business strategy for this because that's one of the things we talk about in CPU all the time. Getting attached to something when you know there's a track record behind it that it's not going to last very long mm -hmm. and I'm going to wait to hear what the reviews are at the end before I even, which then just contributes to declining ratings and mm -hmm. influences the structure even more. Well, and I guess Netflix doesn't really have a great business model in terms that they create all this really expensive stuff and when they raise prices on their subscriptions, it just kind of kills how many people watch their things. But they only make money through really subscriptions and because they don't have ads. They're not like a TV station that well, the brings rumor is money. They want to put ads in it. Well, that's the rumor. Well, they're right? starting to put trailers at the end of shows for their other shows, which yeah. I don't mind so much. It's no. like, oh, you watch this? You might be interested in this. Give it just a quick look. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't mind like that. Not, they not, certainly have been doing that with the Marvel's Defender series. It right? certainly doesn't interrupt the flow of. TV. Especially because I can get out of it the second I want to. Right. It's not like... Speaking of this, this is an excellent related slight tangent. I am so salty <laughs> about the cancellations of Luke Cage and Iron Fist, especially Iron Fist, both only after two seasons, both high concept superhero properties that were a little bit different than the normal. Is this sounding familiar? It's related mm -hmm. to the Sensate discussion. And they canceled those, too. Well, and I, those aren't as expensive. And they had Disney money. Proceed. Well, well, <laughs> yeah, well if know. we're going to talk about that, I believe it's going to be the conspiracy. Heroes for Hire. Heroes for Hire. Well, I think that Marvel, a.k.a. 
the House of Mouse mm-hmm. is going to pull all of their properties so they can have their own streaming service. They've been but talking no about that. No one's going to pay for it. Well, they do have... They Unless have, you're going to pay for it. Yes. Well, everybody wants to have their own streaming service. We're starting to get into... They want to have into, a piece of Netflix. They want to have a... They want, they, they, we're starting to get into that whole, you know, a la carte pricing where the cable TV, we've been telling them we want a la carte pricing for certain shows, but now we're starting to see it. But... We don't want to pay the twenty four ninety nine dollars for you know two or three months. It's because that's just crazy pricing for just one channel or one property. But I mean, we have you see on FX AMC, you're starting to see them. It's like watch our shows without commercials. Just go to FX now, download the app, mm-hmm. pay us money, watch our shows ahead of everybody else. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's the big thing. Oh, did you see the show that's not even out yet? Shut up! <laughs> <laughs> so in answer to the question, the reason why I piped off is because this seems to now be common. It's growing more common. We don't know what's going to happen with the Marvel piece. There mm-hmm. is the talk that they're, they're going to spin off like they did in the comics. But with Sense8, it's kind of a similar situation. They have something that's truly unique, truly different, very high concept, very well told, very acclaimed. There probably was a lot of money in it, and then they cancel it, and then they were shocked by the outcry, so they made a movie. Mm-hmm. And I don't think it deserved to be canceled either. I think they should have given them at least one more full season, and then mm-hmm. told them, this is your last season. Mm-hmm. And then they could have spread out what we saw in the movie a little bit better. I, and I think that would have been better too, because there were definitely moments... And I love action movies, but there were moments when there was so much action going on that I was confused, was confused and wasn't following, and so I started playing on my phone. That's and then I, I really did. missed everything, you know? <laughs> like, then all of a sudden I was like, oh, crap, I haven't been paying attention, and I think things were happening. Yeah, sometimes the action gets a little too much, and it's like, how did Michael Bay get in here? <laughs> <laughs> Well, that whole scene in the, when they are in the tour bus and they yeah. arrive oh, out yes. was mm-hmm. awesome. awesome. Try to track them down. They the tour in. bus part was awesome, but then they got into the building. Well, and I and was it's, so confused. It's really confusing when there are sensates and can change bodies or you know mentally change bodies and you're like but wait who's really there right is that really who i are you really will or are you yeah really? it would have been cool if they could have somehow like, found a way to visually differentiate that just a little bit i didn't even the realize they were all together in paris and at first i wasn't <laughs> either i was like wait how is well, and they weren't always at the same time because, you know, like, Nomi would be talking to someone and they'd be like, and Danielle would be like, oh, is that Nomi? And yeah. then the next scene, they're all in the same room. And I'm like, but wait, wait, wait. wait. Yeah, yeah that, those jump yeah. cuts were brutal, yo. <laughs> yeah. That was a little tricky. So you would have stuck with this show. This was yes. this yeah. is one that sure. you would have had. I would have stuck and with this show, yes. Definitely. So Netflix originally greenlit the show. In your opinion, what do you think motivated that initial decision? And what would you say to the person who runs Netflix now, given that it's been canceled? I would say make sure you have enough money to keep the show running. Otherwise, don't pick it up and we all hope Great that hearts. somebody yeah. else, you know, HBO or somebody picks well, it up. Well, it had a lot of the Wachowski siblings. Mm-hmm. You know, they have this big name with Matrix and their other properties. Yeah. They were thinking they would be bringing in all, all these viewers and unfortunately they just didn't get the numbers they they wanted but that's their story well, but that's their, their numbers <laughs> well the question is in, in, netflix people are paying for the subscription anyway you're not necessarily bringing in new viewers and with the service where your shows are on there forever does it matter what your numbers are at a certain point in time when you have this stuff up there like and especially on binge worthy things because people right. are just going to keep watching things and then they're going to be like five years later oh i've mm-hmm. never even heard of this because maybe it's not what they typically watch and suddenly they're down right. a rabbit hole so does numbers matter in this project when, when it's a subscription service and also like if you see that you have a great product like this and your numbers are failing isn't there some kind of market strategy that you can do to promote the show, you know, like, because so many people, I think, didn't even know I it didn't existed. know about I yeah. am way keyed into TV media, and I did not know about it until yeah. our friend told us about yeah. it. I yeah, saw it, I saw it going through new releases, and it's like, oh, okay, oh, eight people, 
you know, they kind of share memory, share. And it's like, oh, that sounds kind of neat. And it's like, yeah. well, yeah. and like they had, they didn't have that many huge names in the show, with the exception of like the Wachowskis and like the production. Naveen, Naveen Andrews, Naveen well, and Daryl Hannah. Hannah, Daryl Hannah, and Terrence Mann. But, like, He's none of those people character. were main characters. I mean, not really. Not when you get down like to the actual sense eights. Yeah. None of your sense eights yeah, were they huge were mostly, people. Mostly. Which I like thought was so cool, too, and, like, refreshing because yeah. they were all so great. Yeah. You know, like, yeah, I just think that they're, they, I don't think they tried hard enough to keep this show going, and I don't know why, and that's sad to me. Especially because I think they greenlit it because it was so different. Mm -hmm. And with things that are so different, and I think on the edge of, like, new, like, bordering yeah, on this whole edge. new concept and having to do so many unique things, you can't expect that to break through right away. If it happens, that's amazing, and you run with it. But when you're trying something new, you have to let the world catch up. Because the world's not always going to go for the new and exciting thing that makes you think. Right. You know, I, same reason I think Person of Interest should never have been canceled when it was, because I think, honestly... Selena and I have common interests. <laughs> both of them were just so... High concept, so, yeah. intelligent... Yeah. And it, it took some commitment mm -hmm. to watch the show, understand the show, and then be hooked on the show. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with both of your comments, Kelsey's and Celine's. I, I agree that I don't think Netflix did much with it at all, mm -hmm. and therefore didn't really help their cause. And I also agree that now Netflix is starting to veer back towards what I would call a common denominator yeah. type of television, which, I mean, I think they've still got great shows, great original programming. They're starting now to shed some of their longtime properties and bring on new things. And I, I just think the streaming giants in a state of flux because others are getting more on the market. Well, mm -hmm. and there's this interesting thing of where when you're producing niche properties you're bringing in these people who don't normally see themselves in tv and then because you're trying to bring them in and then suddenly because it's not popular you're saying like eh whatever and you're dropping them and then you're losing these people who came here specifically because they saw themselves you know they were like this is new it's exciting it's for me and suddenly all you're pushing is stuff that doesn't have me in it it's like, why start with this concept if you're going to shed it two years later? Well, I think you say, I think you think the show would hold up, right? <laughs> yes. Here. Yeah. And you did not, you did not think it was time for it to go. No. Nope. And you would have watched more seasons. Yep. Should they bring it back? And do you think they will? I don't think they will, but I would love for them to bring it back, even if it's not with this particular cluster. The spinoff. Like if with, they did a spinoff. Spinoff with other clusters, yes. Back in time, or future, or just different ones. Like I would love learning more about the Lacuna. That'd be cool, or any of the other Even clusters. Origin spinoff would be interesting. Just stay away from Lila's, because I don't like her. Yeah, we yeah. <laughs> talked about her. I mean, I think we talked about her a little bit in our last mm -hmm. episodes, but you don't care. All right. <laughs> She was rather obnoxious. She was, always. And you I mean, know, like, I get that that Wolfgang loved sex and all, but, like, girl, chill, you're cool. Like, sex is cool when you're into it, but when you're trying to force it, go. Well, and when she was in her lingerie in the movie, I was, like, and walking down the street, I was like, were they having a projection, or was she really doing that? Because she would really do that. <laughs> I know. So. Yeah, it's... <laughs> Anybody's guess. I also found Leto kind of annoying in the in the movie. Like I it, actually, season one I liked him. Season two it was kind of like meh, and then by season three I was like, you are so histrionic. Stop being such a queen. Like, <laughs> <laughs> okay, you can say that. I was just gonna say. That. <laughs> no, I I had a, I know that my friend that recommended the show loves Leto and yeah. he thinks he's the dreamiest thing since Well he is very dreamy. attractive he's but very I just handsome. found his character wearing. Yes. Very and especially wearing. in in the the season finale. Yeah. Just just whiny and histrionic almost the whole time. I mean I I enjoyed Actors. This. I know right? <laughs> well, that's it. I enjoyed the season two arc when he was processing the fact that he was publicly out better. Yes. And he did the pride celebration yes. in, in South America and all of that stuff. I mean, and I thought that was very it, endearing. Yeah, it was almost like they didn't know what to do with him in the well, finale, so I they just played up his 
like histrionic. There was a story behind why he was doing that that we didn't really get. Like they mentioned at one point, like, "Am I fired? Am I fired?" And you're like, "Are you fired from what? Are you happy about it? Are you sad? You looked happy that you might have just gotten fired." Yeah. And I then mean, he shoot. was doing the jumping thing, and it yeah, seemed like he was prepping for a role, but we don't know what it is. So I just. Yeah. It yeah, seemed it was like there was really... so much more to what was going on that we lost but for whatever ironically, reason. Ironically, we got some really great moments with Hernando and Daniela. In the yes. Finale. So that's what I wasn't competing for me. Yeah, there was even was one scene where they were showing all of the eight, and I was like, where's Leto? Is Leto even there? Maybe <laughs> and then there was like one comedy. sign. Maybe. Like, there was, like he was off to the like one side on the very end. Like, But they showed like close ups of everyone but him until he was in the final part. I just, yeah, but no. maybe. I mean, I gotta. I'll be confessional here. I think he was my least favorite, just because it, maybe it was because he was being a quintessential actor. I don't know. It was just really hard for me. Oh, like, those actors! I don't know. know. <laughs> well, they, they Sorry, that's the actor in the room. He had such a big part in the first season, season two, with him yeah. being gay and, and being closeted, and then him coming out. Yeah, which was they, compelling. They, yeah, yes. and compelling in you know, itself. But after that, it's kind of like. Okay, now we're moving on to different things, and we're kind of they kind of left his character written as more seeing if he just improved it himself. Well, and I also think they didn't know where to go. I mean, yeah. at that point, he was out, and so his whole season two arc was about how can he keep his career going, which mm-hmm. seemed to me to be pretty shallow compared to what everybody else is struggling with. Yeah, <laughs> right. So yeah. maybe that in the end is why he was my well, favorite. You know, Miguel did a fine job. Absolutely. I mean, if they had a season three, they can show Leto struggling to get his career up and running again. Maybe. I mean, I think they did that in two. Mm-hmm. I mean, then he started to get parts that were more gay. gay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Well, that and they didn't necessarily need his skill anymore because his skill was basically in acting and being able to like bluff get through things bluff. and being able to bluff or like yeah. The Bach Gala when he yeah. was helping Son and with the bartending because yeah, that was so cool. and then Son oh. was helping him oh, not yes. be such a manly like actually get in touch with his feelings, which was really cool because Son doesn't get in touch with her feelings, mm-hmm. so to see her. Working through that through Lido was so compelling. Yeah. I, I thought the whole idea of Lido being this player bartender was just just another example of, okay, we need this skill. Who are we gonna give it to? <laughs> yeah. Oh, let's give it to the mopey one right now. <laughs> But yeah, I just think there wasn't much call for skills that he had in the third. It, yeah, you know, it, yeah, they just didn't utilize that character well. I think they kind of—I don't know if they felt written into a corner with him, or just he just his arc was kind of done at that point, and they didn't want to start a new one because it's just a two-hour finale. Possibly, yeah. So yeah, he's almost forgettable in the movie, which mm-hmm. is kind of sad. So as we mentioned, Sense8 was created by the Wachowskis and J. Michael Straczynski. This is the first time the Wachowskis have done anything TV. Mostly with, they've done the movie things we've mentioned. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Straczynski, <clears throat> on the other hand, created, among other properties, She-Ra, the Princess of Power, the original 80s cartoon, Babylon 5, Crusade, the Babylon 5 spinoff, and Jeremiah, which was a one-and-done show. Which I've never, I've never seen any of, although I did want to watch Babylon 5, I just haven't. That has been requested on the podcast. She and she's like, she's like, is anybody like Babylon Five? I said, I'm sorry, man, you're the only one that's mentioned it so far. I've but never seen any of those shows. It's not. It tops science fiction lists, or at mm-hmm. least makes science fiction mm-hmm. lists of best sci-fi TV. Okay. So. How how long is is it a lot? Is it a long show? Season wise, four or five seasons. Maybe? Okay. Late nineties. It, it seemed to be on at the same time as Deep Space Nine. Yeah, that's what I remember from my my childhood of watching Star Trek with my parents. Yes. But I don't think we ever watched Babylon Five, so that's something I've. I haven't seen it. I would. I mean, I would watch Babylon Five. I've I always wanted to. I think I might have watched Shiro when I was a kid, but I don't remember. <laughs> I did. When did that air? In the 80s, because, you know, they had the He-Man, and she yeah. was his cousin. Right. Because that's like Superman and Supergirl. <laughs> I remember all of this, but I don't remember if I actually watched the show or if I just, like, my. I know my grandma had the action figures, so I'm trying to remember if I actually watched the show or if I made a show up in my head about it. But there was a whole I think I did watch She-Ra. I liked it, if I, <laughs> if I remember correctly. It would have been very little. 
I would have been, mm-hmm. yeah. Like, okay, because, yeah, I was born in 85, so. Mm-hmm. And I seem to remember it being, like, 7, 8, 9, 10 yeah. age for me, so, yeah, that would have been right around that time. Yeah. But my brother and he man, and then they came out with she and I was like, oh, good, one for me. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's how I did it. So would you watch any other series created by either of these people or the combination I think of them. I definitely would, and definitely yeah. if it was a collaborative, if it was both of them, because I think they worked really well together on this. Yeah, I would give it a shot. I would too. I mean, I think this is such a smart story and <clears throat> such a complex storytelling that they engaged in that I'm impressed just by their ability to create it and to write it, to think it up. And I would follow them to all their other new ideas. Agreed. <laughs> so. And I mean, I have such a huge love for V for Vendetta that... Mm-hmm. I have a big love for the Matrix, not the third one. <laughs> I mean, no, but no, but no. visually, visually it was all stunning. three of them. Yeah. Are excellent. and the first movie is really good and really intense. Mm-hmm. Yes, I feel like what's going on? What is the Matrix? There I is just, no spoon. I <laughs> would love to just sit in a room with the Wachowskis and talk. I would love to just pick their brains and be like, show me. Just, I want how to see how your brain, brain works. You want to whisper them. <laughs> no, <laughs> not that way. <laughs> no, that's just being too creepy. <laughs> it was a scary thing. I will always take it there. Sorry. <laughs> here's a line, here's Kelsey. <laughs> I'm waving at you from the other side. <laughs> how does Sensei compare to other genre TV shows, specifically high concept science fiction, Queer subjects, etc. So I have been waiting to bring this up because. Oh, good! It's a Kelsey. It's go for it. Maybe a little bit. Go for just, it. Kelsey. I just have a little thing. So when my sibling first told me about this show, they were explaining like, "Oh yeah, it's people and they're like in each other's minds," and I was like, "Oh, I just watched that because I had just seen the movie. What's it called? I just googled. In your eyes." It's a Joss Whedon movie, and it's about a man and a woman who have sort of a sensate type connection, but it's not as large scale. It's a smaller scale, like they both live relatively near each other because they end up somehow meeting in the middle of wherever they live, and she has to escape from like a, I think she gets institutionalized and he helps her escape, and then they end up falling in love, and it's a whole different thing. But I just thought it was so weird that my sibling brought up this show, like, right after I had watched that movie. Were you having a sensei connection with your sibling? Maybe I was. <laughs> Maybe I was. It's not even my Gemini sibling, so I don't know. Weird. But, yeah, very weird. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I just think it was, it's cool that there is something else like that out there. And that is something that people who are not so into the TVMA thing could watch and still enjoy this concept on a much smaller scale. So I've been waiting to say that until it was appropriate. But also, I think, comparing it to other high-concept science fiction, and the thing that I think of the most is like, well, The Matrix, really, but I think it's better flushed out than The Matrix ended up being. Well, I mean, if The Matrix um, had two and a half TV possibly, series, like 20-some hours I would so watch stuff. that. Except for that the two sequels could have and didn't. That, see, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> I mean, maybe if they were series, but still, I think... It went in a completely different direction than I thought it was going to go, The Matrix did. But yeah, and then it ended <laughs> super confusing. And yeah. Then the Christians tried to say it was like a Christian... Allegory. Allegory, yeah, and that was weird. I disagree. I, <laughs> most people, I think, do. I don't know. I disagree also. And Lost, it kind of reminded me of Lost in, in the whole, like, puzzle way and maybe also because of Saeed. Saeed. <laughs> but well and whispers kind of reminded me of it's been so long since I the saw Lost. Black. Yeah, maybe a little bit. I don't know. Some some there was some similarities, I think, but not enough. I mean, I still think this was better than that too. Yeah. So. Well, and Lost could have ended sooner, I think. And I think they could have wrapped that up neater. That's for and our it could last have podcast, which it we sure will is. have someday. Oh, you haven't had one yet? No, because I a, I haven't had the request. People want to talk about it, but every time I say, do you want to be on a panel, they're like, how would you do that panel? And I'm like, I don't know. I don't have an answer. <laughs> <laughs> I think you'd have to take it season by season. I think so, too. It's so complex. It's okay. very complex. And that's really the reason. That's the only thing that I would compare Sensei I, to. Yeah. I'm not very you know high up on queer subjects, but... Science fiction well, subjects I'm very high up on. In terms of queer 
TV, I think this goes farther than anything else uh, there yes. is. Like, okay, so. the closest thing I think you can even compare it to would be the L word. And this took it in... It's so uh, much more <laughs> inclusive yeah, and, well. and cross... Intersectional. Intersectional. This is Thank so you. much more intersectional. I mean, granted, it's also like, what, 10, 15 years later? How long ago was the L word? Forever ago. And it's not, God love the L word, but the L word was strictly about white rich like, lesbians. Well, yeah, well not all white. Not all white. But, <laughs> and, and, well, yeah. And it, you know, was just about. It, it, it was, was like sex in the city for lesbians. I, I see feel. sex in the city, so I, I don't <laughs> Whereas this show was about everything. Like, it wasn't just about... I mean, it was all about relationships, but relationships in such a, like, a cosmic way. And a broad, versus, broader terms. In bro yeah, and, like, community and relationship between people versus the world and the world versus one section. And it was... I, th I think it just transcended so much but it was so it, it didn't put sexuality in a box in the way that the l word did the l word was not really accessible to other people than the queer community and strictly almost strictly lesbians and bisexual women like yes other people could enjoy it but it wasn't trying to reach them whereas this show is trying to reach everyone and show everyone the complexities and not even just in sexuality, but also in like polyamory and the fact that you don't have to just be monogamous. That you have like Nietzsche's mom who and her three dads. Yeah. Like, and that concept, it's such a beautiful thing that I don't think most people, like 90% yeah. of this world would look at that and be like, oh, what the hell? Yeah. <laughs> And, and it showed it to you in a way that's not, I think, alienating. Because it doesn't make you... Like, in the L word, they'd have shown you something like that. And it would have been in such a sexualized way that people would have been like, oh, no. Or, or you would have seen the other characters judging it in some way. Yes. And even, even Nomi's mom was just like, she didn't know what to do with it. But she wasn't like, oh, no. Like, it was... Well, she, she was, was at first. Well, yeah. She had to evolve Nomi's mom. Well, no, no we're Nomi's talking about in the scene where with, she meets when she meets Nietzsche's mom and her oh, three dads. Okay. Like it, it was strictly a what is going on moment, not a get the hell away from me, your yeah. demon people or it's, whatever. Which is how it is in a lot of other things. And I think that's what's unique about the show is it it gets to show you all of these different ways of life without judging them in the show. Or making them seem like they're abnormal yes. or outside and, or other. Well, what was a really interesting moment for me was that moment in when Kala, we think, is dead. Yeah. And then she Which wakes up. I started up. to cry. Oh, I definitely did. Exactly. Definitely did. Actually, I didn't start crying until all of the other sensates were kneeling right beside her, and that's when I just lost it. Okay, minor aside, I did the same thing in the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Don't <laughs> Kneeling. It's something about kneeling. And she goes, <laughs> but that was very nerdy. It's okay, Chad. Right, it's okay. <laughs> but, you know, I, with being going back to that scene of Kala almost dying, and it's like, oh, man, I hope the show... I hope they don't kill one of the eight. And they almost did, but then the Kala comes back. If you people would stop crying, help me. <laughs> this is what you need to do. Do not let me die. Yeah, that was she crazy. wasn't quite so demanding. Also, like gentle. not not only did they not kill any of the main eight, main eight but they also didn't kill any of their queer characters which was really commendable probably the first time ever right yeah <laughs> just about possibly about. because it seems to be that people th that tv shows think the best way to write compelling stories for their queer characters is to kill them off in hopefully a dramatic way not always so that was also i think a benchmark for queer tv that that all the characters survive and have happy endings yeah well, it was a very happy ending for everybody. Yeah. Well, and like, as I was saying, though, when like Kala almost dies and then she's brought back to life and she immediately kisses Wolfgang, Kelsey and I were both like, because oh, Rajan's right there. And we're like, oh, no, how is this going to go? Oh, oh this and is going to be so awful and awkward and bad. And, and then it wasn't. 
And that was just such a sigh of relief because leading up to that, you've seen all this stuff that compels you to tell that you that Raja knows and that he's not mad about it, but you're still not sure until that moment. And it's just so, it was relieving to not have that be the tension, to not have a love triangle be the tension in this scene that doesn't need any more tension yeah we don't need more unnecessary drama and i mean that is a legit reason to be mad but it was just really relieving not to have that for once because everything has an unnecessary love triangle in it there is you're hard pressed to find a tv show that doesn't and for this love triangle not to be the dramatic twist when the people meet was refreshing. But a love triangle is in column A of plot devices. I know. <laughs> so is killing queer characters. <laughs> so thanks for not using column A. <laughs> Thank you for choosing something else in column A. <laughs> right. Well, and that, that just brings me back around to comparing it to other science fiction shows. There really is no comparison that I can think of, and I watch a lot of science fiction. Mm -hmm. I can't think of one that even remotely comes close. Maybe Lost, just yeah. because of its complexity. But complexity. But Lost had a completely different spin on it, and even though there was a lot of different characters and a, kind of a living, breathing setting or locale, <laughs> yeah, it, it it's not the same. And there wasn't the the themes of unity and the that when we work together we can achieve big things. Which well, well, except for live together, die alone. That was oh, the thing. Yeah, but it didn't. It wasn't an all encompassing theme that arced through the whole show. Right. Which I feel this is and would have continued to be Agreed. had there been more seasons. A loss was so much more. It felt so much more supernatural or fantasy based, mm -hmm. whereas this was still set. Sci -fi in a real and, kind of place, mm -hmm. sci-fi like, yeah. right? Yeah. So if you want something that is completely and uniquely its own animal, Sensate is the show for you. Definitely. And ironically, it's so human. It's very human. <laughs> for a show about people who are more than being human, it is a very human show. That's a lovely way to say that, Celine. <laughs> a plus comment. Thanks. So, the <laughs> now you're blushing. <laughs> I complimented her. <laughs> like you mentioned earlier, many of the actors were brand new. Mm -hmm. Some of them had previous projects. Miguel Angel Silvestre is in Narcos. Freema Aguiman, of course, and Sylvester McCoy are both Doctor Who mm -hmm. people. And of course, Freema was on Torchwood too. Naveen mm -hmm. on Lost. Brian J. Smith was in Stargate Universe, which lasted for like two seasons. <laughs> Terrence Mann was in The Dresden Files, which lasted for one. Would you follow any of the people, including the international actors, just getting an American foothold to new projects? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I think so. I don't know if I would go back and watch things that they've already been in at this point. Like I want to watch Narcos. I would be interested in. I need to see what that's about more, but. And I kind of um, want to rewatch the Dresden Files because I tried to watch it, and then I got away from it, and then it got canceled. I never watched it. It did sound interesting though. I watched the, the season. I was really intrigued with the whole idea of taking a fantasy magical character that was from a book series mm -hmm. and converting it into TV, but I just don't think the networks were ready to go further with it. Well, it was on sci-fi, too, which didn't help it. Oh, it's sci-fi. But it was played by Paul Blackthorne, who went on to do six seasons of Arrow as yeah. Quentin Lance. Yeah. I like him, so I want to give it another try. Yeah. And of course, Daryl Hannah has been a movie star for a long time. <laughs> so yes. She yeah. was in Splash, darn it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I remember... <laughs> She will forever be the the queen giant in Jack and the Beanstalk. Oh, well, that's story. your association. That I was the first that. thing I ever <laughs> saw her in, and then yeah. it's Kill Bill. No, yeah. for it's me, right. for me, Kill Daryl Bill. Hannah is the quintessential scene of her is her relaxing in the tub and letting her tail go out. Yes, yeah, I've Splash. never seen Splash. Splash. I've never oh, seen it. Oh, gotta watch. It's we own it, don't we? I think so. Tom Hanks, okay. Daryl Hannah. Yeah. So fun. It's a fun movie. Complete 80s. Yeah. John Candy. Oh my god. Oh, yeah. John Candy. I love him. Would you and then isn't she the mom him? in A Walk to Remember? I'm checking this right now. Yes, she is. She's the mom in A Walk to Remember. Mm -hmm. She is? Yes. Yeah. I cry anyway. every time. It's Would great. you recommend Sense8? Yes. 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 Have you recommended Sense8? Yes. yes. <laughs> Facebook feed. History to prove it. <laughs> it's yeah. true. 
I would recommend it. I think we I think we've pretty much justified why we would. Mm -hmm. I think it's like in my top two things of things I recommend to people. Really? The other one being a podcast that's not this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Recommend this podcast. I recommend this podcast too, okay. but it's not in my top two. Fine. <laughs> it's the third one. It's the third. Jeez. Well, because because I'm I'm friends with so many sci-fi nerds in particular that the top two are sci-fi related. This so what is the podcast? Bizarre states. Bizarre states. Okay. I have a crush on Chobot, so that's part of it. Is there anything else you want to say or any other eulogy driven comments you want to make for the show that was sensei? R.I.P. Come back. Spin off. <laughs> you don't have to whisper. This is a podcast. Spin off! All right. Oh, wow. Well, that was loud enough for me to be convinced that if you <laughs> if you weren't convinced by sensei and our many accolades for it before, you should be convinced by it now. But I think they've said what they're going to say. I've said what I need to say. Have you sensed what we're feeling? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and if you haven't, then at least go to Netflix and give it a try. But for right now, I think we've talked ourselves out of Sensei. So I want to thank Celine, Kelsey, and Chad for joining me to talk about Sensei and for looking back and taking a first look at it. And because I thank them and we talked about Sensei, I now have to say, CPU is produced by Backpacker Productions. Over here is truly the Chief Couch Potato and hails from Grand Rapids, Michigan. Would you please, if you like what you hear, take the time to rate us on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, or Google Play. That means give us stars, put in some comments, reviews, tell the people how we are. Recommend us in your top two podcasts. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell? That's my top two things. That's my top two podcasts. Oh, okay. It's definitely my second podcast. <laughs> she walking back on that comment. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> if you have suggestions on TV shows we might consider to discuss on this wonderful podcast, contact us at our website, couchpotatoesunite.wordpress.com, by email at couchpotatoesunitepodcast at gmail.com, or via Facebook and Twitter. And of course, we have several old and new shows to chat about around the water cooler all the time. We have several more coming down the pipe. We always have a parade, and if you miss old episodes or want to know in general what we cover, just find us. We top Google searches under Couch Potatoes Unite because we are united. Until the next time, Sense8 is available to stream on Netflix as the streaming giant is the one who made the series. And they don't give us money, but there it is. If you have nominations for shows we should cover in our ongoing Looking Back series, contact us via social media or our email. But in the meantime, and until next time, until next episode, new episodes published every Wednesday. Keep listening. Keep watching. Stay tuned. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.